These are um, four microstrip transmission lines with a plane underneath, uniform transmission lines. Um, and you can see they're not very close together. They're, um, you know, roughly, I think this was three line widths apart, so relatively far apart. We've got ports on the ends that we launch the signal. We have ports on the back end that we take out the signal, continues along into 50 ohms. And we're going to launch a signal into one of these guys. And here it is. I have, I have a question. So yeah. the signal is, this is what we see is basically the edge of the signal, like? Yes, this is, it's a pulse. Okay. And so we're going to send this pulse of voltage. Pulse, uh, it means voltage. up and down? Yeah. Okay. So it turns on and off. And this is, we're actually plotting the current density on the conductor surface. And you can't see it, but um, it's in the, it's in the, we're looking at the plane underneath. The top surface of the plane is where we're looking at the return current. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a, a setup slide here. This is just the, what the return current does. And you can see that as the signal propagates, it spreads out a little bit in the plane, but it's, you know, pretty well confined within about a line width or two, you know, three line widths between them. So it's about, you know, one or two line widths extent on either side of the signal line is how far it spreads out. And that says, you know, we're not going to have a whole lot of crosstalk between um, this aggressor where we have the signal and the victim lines on either side. I right? know what these lines to follow. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so, so now this is with a nice wide uniform return path. And as long as the return path is wide enough to contain all of that return current, then there's no crosstalk. It doesn't matter how long, how, how wide we make that plane. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add a gap in that plane. And so here is, uh, yeah, I'm going to, let me see if I have, I get another one here. Maybe this is a better perspective shot. Um, let me see if I can make this bigger for you. Okay, so here's the same structure. I'm going in the opposite direction now. That's okay. So we're going to launch a signal. It's propagating along, but now we have a gap in the return path. And what is that return current going to do? Well, it has to spread out. It's going to spread out between this cap. It's not really a cavity, but it's a it's a waveguide between the the plane on one edge, the plane on the other edge. It's going to be spread out. And look, we get that current going out, and as it goes out. It induces current that spreads out on the other conductor. In fact, all of them. This is the adjacent one. Look, it's even two away. That Look at that noise that suddenly gets injected. Look at that noise that gets injected onto the, um, the adjacent conductors and the ones farther away. Very long range noise. Before, there was no crosstalk between the aggressor and the victims, but as soon as it crosses that gap, we get a mixing of the return currents. The return current spreads out. We call this a slot wave transmission line. It's a, a gap, and and um, and and it's between the signal and return on the two edges here. That signal propagates out. We see it propagating out, hitting the ends, bouncing a little bit, and as it goes, coupling into the adjacent conductors. Okay, and again, uh, an example that you can't do this with a 2D tool. It requires a 3D full wave tool. Okay, go. So this is interesting because I, why, why this pick up with these other lines? I would expect like it only spreads uh, around the gap on the plane and it doesn't really right. travel back through the other tracks. Right. If I didn't have these tracks, if I just had the one signal and I had the gap, then I would, and you can almost see it as it comes here, I'm inducing the return current over here at the beginning has to get from this side to this side. And remember we said when we had two cavities, there was some impedance between the, the two cavities, mm -hmm. right? And the return current flowed between the impedance. Well, I have two two conductors. Mm -hmm. Forget about the connection over mm -hmm. here. Okay. The signal as it hits here, it doesn't see it. All it sees is two conductors. Mm -hmm. That is a waveguide. And I get current induced in these two conductors. It sees an impedance and it splits and spreads out. And I get, I get, uh, signal return, I get signal return, signal return, signal return, signal return, signal return, signal return, signal return. It's spreading out as it's as it's going, flowing between the impedance of that slot. And when it encounters, now I have this this um, uh, this trace above it, when it encounters, I have current flowing between those two edges this way, it's going to induce current mm -hmm. in the top conductor, a signal return loop in the top conductor, and that is going to split and go both ways. Mm -hmm. So basically so we're getting this the noise uh, uh -huh. appears 
uh, in the area where the gap is, and then it just travels right. through the track. Okay. And then it, it propagates in both directions mm -hmm. in the victim lines, and we see that propagating out there. It We get a little bit of reflection from the ends. Um, we, we get, there's an impedance discontinuity here, so you notice we, we get a little bit of signal that, that reflected there. This guy that got induced over here, it, it reflects back and forth here, and we see the a couple pulses. So it's a you know complex structure that propagates out, but fundamentally it's all because of the the um, discontinuity and the return current flowing back and forth here, inducing noise in the quiet line, and and quite a bit of noise. That's why uh, we say don't have gaps in the return path because you will get crosstalk between the signals crossing the gaps. It couples through the gap. Tricky question. Yeah. So, based on this, it looks like if the gap is wide enough, then it should not induct these currents because impedance will be too high, and when the gap is very slow, then the noise is going to be bigger, or... <laughs> The, it does, well, so that there, doesn't make sense, so right, I, I right. believe that's wrong. There are two two dimensions to talk about. One is the width of the gap and the thickness and the and the length of the gap. So I call the length of the gap this dimension here. Mm -hmm. That's how far you're traveling over. This is the width of the gap. Mm -hmm. So if we, and, and remember we said with the cavity, then voltage noise induced is, we got a fixed amount of return current. And so the voltage noise is about the impedance of the cavity and that current, return current flowing through it. And so in order to reduce the voltage noise, the return current's fixed. To reduce the voltage noise, we want to reduce the impedance. Mm -hmm. And the same thing in this gap. The voltage noise induced is related to the impedance of that gap. And if you wanted to reduce the impedance of the gap in the vicinity over here, forget about what happens at the ends, mm -hmm. but in the vicinity over here, what what dimension, what would you want to do to the length of the gap? You want to make it wider or make it narrower to reduce the impedance between the, the two edges? Just make it smaller, no? Exactly. You bring those two conductors closer, you make the gap length, you make the gap length shorter, you'll have a lower impedance, you'll still have a discontinuity, you'll still have a voltage generated, but it'll be less. And so it says, use as short a gap as practical. But you're still going to have an impedance discontinuity. It's still going to generate noise. How much noise? Oh, that's really hard to estimate with pencil and paper. That's where you use the 3D field solver to do that estimate. And effectively, what we do is we get, and you know, the the impact is to have higher loop inductance, mutual inductance between this signal and its return, and this signal and its return. And the shorter you can make that gap. The, the, the shorter the length, the the shorter the width you can make that, the lower the loop inductance, mutual inductance is gonna be between the aggressor and the victims. But there will always be much higher mutual inductance between the signal and return and an aggressor with the gap than without the gap. Mm -hmm. You remember what we saw without the gap, there was hardly any induced noise on the other trace. So sometimes- um, With the gap, a yeah, lot more. Sometimes uh, if there is no other way, then uh, there are recommendations to place capacitors. Is it a good idea? Yeah, yeah. So very good. So um, the the it's all about reducing the impedance across the gap. And so it's a question of how effective can you be in reducing the impedance. The best way is continuous return plane. No discontinuity. It's just the continuous impedance signal sees. If you have to have a gap, then there are two solutions. Uh, let's see. Do I? I don't have. I don't have that other example here. But the the one solution is don't send a single ended signal. Send a differential signal. Mm -hmm. And if it's differential, then yeah, we still have return currents in the plane down below. But where the return currents overlap for a tr a true differential signal, the return currents cancel out, and the impact of the crosstalk from one differential pair to another dramatically reduced. So that's one. And that's what for that's why uh, differential pairs are so robust to return path discontinuities. The second solution, if uh, you're going to send single ended signals and you have to cross a gap, you add a a a DC block. You you add a short between the planes. But you if they're different voltages, if they're the same voltage, then don't have a gap. 
make it continuous. But if they're a split ground plane, for example, and this is why it's so dangerous using a power plane as a, um, a reference, a return plane, because if a power plane is a return plane and you have a, two different voltages on that power plane and, there, and you get return current in the power plane, then when that signal crosses the gap in the power plane to the different power planes, um, you're going to get voltage noise between the two power planes and crosstalk between the, the signals that cross that gap. You can't add a short between the two different power planes. And so you do the best thing you can. You add a short with a DC block in it. And that's what the capacitor does. It's a DC short, uh, I'm sorry, it's a DC block, but it is a short. And you want to engineer it to be as low an impedance short as you can. But how do you add a capacitor across two planes? You have to pop vias up to the top surface, go across, and pop vias back down. And whenever you do that, it's not a short anymore. It's an inductive loop. And you always have some residual inductance in that path. And above, you know, roughly, you got to put in the numbers, but roughly in the 10 megahertz frequency range, that DC blocking capacitor doesn't look like a capacitor anymore. It looks like an inductor. Mm -hmm. And we have inductive coupling. And we have the the shared inductance of that of that capacitor loop. And so you think, you see, oh, capacitor, low impedance, high frequency. You think, oh, capacitor, that's a great way of doing it. It's a great way of doing it while it acts like a capacitor. But above the, you know, it's roughly in the 10 megahertz kind of range, roughly in the 10 megahertz range, the inductance of that loop now dominates the impedance. And it's like you've added an inductor in that path. So it means so the voltage will be even higher between these edges and it's going to be even worse? Yes. You'll have inductance in that path. It'll be better than not having a okay. capacitor there, but you still have, don't fool yourself into thinking that's the ultimate solution. So it may just if stop I'm, working for about some frequencies. Yeah, exactly. It may be great if you got 100 megabits per second signals passing through there. It may be just fine. But as soon as you start sending gigabit signals, single-ended, um, it may have significant amount of crosstalk across that gap. Mm -hmm. And that's where, how do you know if that's going to be the case? You have to put in the numbers. And one of the rules of thumb that I'm going to um, present in my, my webinar on the uh, 18th of May with the SI Journal is going to be how do you estimate the induct the loop inductance of a capacitor and how do you estimate at what frequency does that capacitor transition from looking like a capacitor to looking like an inductor. And I think those are really valuable numbers to keep in mind because you have to train your intuition. When you see a capacitor, you think, yeah, low frequency, but that keyword is low frequency. Where is that transition frequency? And being able to put in the numbers to know when that frequency is, is really, really important.